Hello, everyone. Welcome to another awesome day of FileMaker training. I'm Richard Carlton, creator of FMTraining.tv, where we're always doing great FileMaker training. Sometimes even you're training us, which is awesome. Today is day three of our credit card processing uh, kind of educational process. Today, uh, I'll introduce this shortly, but Bill, Bill is here, one of our very, very, very senior engineers, expert at credit card processing, one of those folks that's available if you need help. He can help you out with that. So, Coming up on our upcoming broadcast schedule today, it's Monday today, day three, right? So day one was kind of PCI compliance. Day two was authorized.net, understanding how and why you might want to use authorized.net along with a sample file, which was really great. And then today is like some interesting tips and tricks and, and doing this kind of stuff with FileMaker Go and WebDirect. Tomorrow, SSL certificates. This is all the encryption uh, stuff that goes on with uh, web servers and FileMaker servers. Klaus Levin, I haven't talked to Klaus in a couple of years. And he, him and I were pretty tight at one point doing a lot of uh, live streams and things like that. He'll be back doing his SSL kind of conversation, something that Jacob Taylor can do, but Klaus has a kind of his own perspective on it. It's always good to see someone else's perspective and getting uh, different ideas from people. So he'll be covering SSL certificates beginning to end the basics of installing it first then understanding what's changed in the FileMaker platform because there were some changes in 19.3 uh, for sure and uh, so that's important then day and then Wednesday apparently Nick is got his computer fixed Thursday uh, November 4th this coming week we've got uh, the return of Mr. Watson Watson is off the hook if you want to like a British crazy version of me that's what Watson is. I've never met anyone quite as crazy as, as I am, and that's him. Then Friday, the opposite of Watson. Watson is very kind of a juicy, colorful language, kind of British guy that's moved to Germany. Uh, then we have a legit, serious, very serious, dry sense of humor German uh, named uh, <laughs> Christian Schmidt. And so he is uh, probably, if I had to guess, the smartest FileMaker person ever, anywhere. I know. Um, and so uh, he has a product called Monkey Bread, which a lot of people use. And so what we do is on Friday, we do Stump the Monkey. So what it is is you come with an idea or a question or problem. Some Your customer says, I need you to connect uh, Elon Musk, Tesla driving at 65 and have a talk to FileMaker so that I know what SpaceX is doing. And you need to like do all this layered processing and a couple API things. And, and if you can stump the monkey, last time we did this, we had 15 questions for him. There was one he couldn't answer of the 15. So if you want a question answered and you want like a guarantee, I did, not, I'm not saying it's a free answer. I'm just saying it's a, a ac, ac, actual answer that you can get there. Probably buying his plugin, most cases, will solve the problem. So that's pretty exciting. So that's coming up. So as a reminder, this broadcast is only Funk, it's only available. It only it only works. Uh, not even the right word. It only works because of all the hard people who put in on this. So I'm going to bring up Discord here real quick on this computer. You can see this briefly here. I think I want to thank everyone who were who was coming over here. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, Ed, Foxy, Jack, Jericho, Ken, Kyle, Scott, Schmeagel, a whole bunch of people in YouTube. Mark, do we have a, a buzz on the people from uh, YouTube, or is that a different group of people? What do we got? Uh YouTube, we've got Michelle and Lynn. If anyone else is there, say hello. Oh, yeah. uh, Twitch, we have Alpha Lima 92651. Oh, really? Okay, Kill. great. That's great. He always has great questions. Good, 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 uh, good. Jericho, Russell, Texas Fly, and Woody DKW. All right. That's awesome. Great. Okay, great. Well, everyone, I want to appreciate that. As a reminder, uh, for those of you who ha have subscriptions to our bundle training, Never mind the uh, technical malfunction that just befalled me on live TV. Uh, befell me. Uh, this is the bundle page. If you go to fmtrain.tv, we highly appreciate it. If you go to this website and you purchase one of our training bundles, it helps us pay the bills. And that way we can get basic how to use a Mac for dummy books, right? <clears throat> so anyway, uh, cool. All right. With that in mind, I'm going to kind of pivot to Bill. This is Bill. So this yeah, is Bill. So Bill Bill is a credit card expert. So Bill, what are we doing today with credit cards? We are going to extend our discussion that we had yesterday, which was, or not yesterday, but Friday, which was the basics of how to use credit cards with, uh, with FileMaker through the authorized.net gateway. We're going to extend it to FileMaker Go and FileMaker WebDirect. 
And um, this is really a kind of a cool thing because um, you can't use plugins with FileMaker Go and FileMaker Web Direct. But it turns out you actually can. You just got to get a little more creative. So um, I'll be kind of a basic disclaimer on this stuff, okay? By telling everybody how to do this, in no way, shape, or form, am I saying that WebDirect is the ultimate platform for web credit card transactions or FileMaker <laughs> Go is the way you should do it. That's not what I'm saying. That said, there are, are little niches that can can make use of WebDirect or FileMaker Go, and you can extend them with credit card transactions on a case-appropriate basis. Um, I'm not saying you should go, you know, take your client's Django website and rewrite it in WebDirect. Not a good idea. Um, so we have no responsibility for your choice to use the technique shown um, and develop and go in WebDirect or execute credit card transactions from within them. So use this stuff at your own risk. Um, in fact, I strongly suggest that if you've never done this type of thing before, drop us a line, give us a call, support at rcconsulting.com, and uh, either myself or, or another engineer can can kind of hold your hand through it because there are some pitfalls. Um it's it's fairly fairly deep water. So um, FileMaker Go is is actually one of the coolest things in the FileMaker universe because it does extend FileMaker pretty well. Um, there's some limitations as we all know, but for for most things you can just design it in FileMaker and it works with Go, um, and it does just about everything a full PC or Mac client can do. We know it's iOS based, um, but you have to kind of get around its limitations. WebDirect is sort of the, the redheaded stepchild of the FileMaker universe. Um, I think it started off as a good idea, and Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, but it it originated with um, IWP, right? Instant Web Publishing or something? Yeah, it goes way back in the day. There was a product called Instant Web Publishing, which is another great name for it, and uh, it was a really badly implemented execute. That came out with FileMaker 4. And it never really got any love until about FileMaker 12, and then WebDirect came out. And uh, I'm forgetting the name of the gentleman who built it. He uh, he used it as a springboard for his career. He built it, then he went to product management at Claris, then he jumped ship and went to Salesforce. And uh, it was a, kind of a nice guy, but he, he's also the guy who decided that, uh, if you've noticed, the web browser on the FileMaker server uh, is missing a lot of features. They've all been removed. That was his idea, right? So it wasn't like the guy wasn't without faults, right? Um, in fact, when Claris figured out what he'd done, it was kind of too late to un unfix that. So they're trying to bring all the missing features back in the FileMaker server web interface. Uh, I think that started with either 16 or 17. But anyway, in there, it's definitely with uh, 19, they're trying to add this stuff back in. But uh, he built this thing. And uh, everyone was blown away at the time how much greater and better it was. It's pretty clear based upon the things that Claris had said recently that they are uh, replacing WebDirect with something better. Um, I don't know when that happens. I don't think it's uh, – I, I think – realistically before it's ready for prime time you're talking at least 12 months away because we haven't even seen it in a a functional prototype yet which means that then the developers have to get it and try to break it and then eventually makes its way to the public so i would say a replacement for web direct is coming and if it really kicks out it'd be this great that's what they're really trying to do but it's not a near-term thing so if you need a web browser client in the near term Either you write your own with PHP or D data API and HTML and JavaScript, stuff like that, or use WebDirect. And this conversation today is about WebDirect. So go ahead. Okay. Well, one of its biggest issues is it's flat because it's in a, a browser. There's no depth in the layout. So when you start layering controls and such, it breaks. And so you have to be really careful in your layouts. And obviously, it doesn't have the, all the features that a full client does. It's just a, a basic emulation, right? So... With that said, we can we can uh, do away with a lot of the crap that's been said about it, though. And these are things I've actually been told um, from people about both of these. And, um, you know, some developer tells a, a prospective client that web directs a waste of time. You know, let me build you a website. Well, you're talking about a huge cost difference there. You know, a full website for a, a large business, you know, might be sixty to one hundred thousand dollars. You can do the same thing in WebDirect, provided the functions are appropriate for half that or even less. Um, the, the one that cracks me up is the FileMaker Go is, is for people too cheap to buy computers. Well, you still got to buy iPads. 
and then put the infrastructure in to use them. So, I mean, that kind of goes out the window. FileMaker Go, though, gives you the, the mobility, which is nice. And then uh, uh, somebody who doesn't understand anything, you know, my boss said we should just make an iOS app for, for people to use instead of FileMaker Go or WebDirect. And, you know, we hear that a lot. You know, a standard thing is people call us up and they say, hey, can you guys build me a, a, a app for my, you know, widget to do this? And, and you know, how much will that cost? And, well, the price tag is, you know, sixty to 80000 plus ongoing development to keep it updated. People have no concept of what goes into making an iOS app or an Android app, for that matter. So for all these reasons, you know, Go versus WebDirect are actually viable solutions, but you have to employ them correctly. Um, but again, for credit cards, they don't they don't support plugins. And iOS, it's because of sandboxing, and there's no way to to you know call out to a separate plugin file. WebDirect, it's just a browser. Um, Which also means it's sandbox too is the same. Issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's no way to access the plugin. So what we have to do is figure out a, a workaround. And I know somebody out there is probably madly typing, you know, you can do this all through, you know, direct calls to the, the authorized.net, blah, blah, blah. Yes, you can. As we talked about in Friday's lecture, you can do it through um, insert from URL. You can probably write JavaScript to do it. I don't know. I'm not a JavaScript expert, but there's a lot of different ways to skin this particular cat. Um, the easiest for most FileMaker developers, though, is using the 360 Works Plastic plugin. And that's the problem with, with these two platforms. So you have one solution, um, or two solutions. The first is uh, perform script on server. And I'm going to show you some examples of this stuff because I use this heavily. Um, you offload the processing work to FileMaker Server. FileMaker Server can use the Plastic plugin. But you have to have the enterprise license if you're going to put it on the uh, the web publishing uh, engine, and that does cost quite a bit more. So that's a that's a drawback. You really need to have an economically viable business need to go that route. Um, you got to have the SSL on FileMaker Server uh, to encrypt the traffic both ways, and it's technically fairly difficult. It's uh, there's a, there's a few tricks to it. You know, it's not something you're going to watch a YouTube video on <clears throat> and then just do it. Um, so the other issue with perform script on server is the web is asynchronous. And so what that means is things do not proceed in an orderly manner from A to Z. Um, so you can send out your web call to say authorize a credit card. And while it's doing its web routing and going to authorize.net and back, um, the user can navigate away. And so this thing comes back and it, it and it doesn't exist anymore for the for the web call to respond to and so the web call just disappears um, and other ridiculous problems that you run into with um, with timing of the interface and the the back end and the third party connections um, web direct seems to fight with itself sometimes or or as i note the the user mucks it up um, when i say web direct fights with itself what i mean is web direct tries to give you that that live connection to the database like you see with um, a FileMaker Pro client, but it's not as good. And I think if you get a connection that has a little bit of lag in it, some latency, WebDirect kind of goes to hell. It forgets where it's at and it can really literally lose where it's at in scripts when that happens. Um, and so that also leaves you with the same problem as the asynchronous behavior. Your script never gets an answer. Um, and then I already mentioned the expensive nature of the enterprise license. So I generally don't use perform script on server to execute um, credit card transactions for these reasons. It's useful for other things, as we'll get to, but uh, not for credit cards. And um, so we use them for things like creating creating records and other tables, um, creating a report where you don't want to, you know, wait for a, a browser client to, to gin it up and, and spit it out. Um, and I have some examples to show you. Uh, the second uh, solution for credit cards on WebDirect and FileMaker Go is to use a robot. Now, a lot of people call them different things. For as long as I can remember, though, Richard, we've always called it a robot from the one that was first ginned up for uh, for uh, our mutual friend yeah. all the way up till now. So um, a robot is just a specialized program. That's all it is. Uh, it's a huge loop with a bunch of other stuff hanging off of it. 
and it goes down through a list of sub-processes and executes them like a robot, um, hence the name. And we've used it for myriad tasks across tons of different clients, but it can do anything that a human user can do only better because humans screw up and the robot just does, does things like a computer. So um, there's three parts to it. Uh, the file itself, which exists on the machine that you're using as a robot um, and the sub process, those exist in your main file usually, and then um, a dedicated machine to run it. And where people screw this up is they try to put a robot on their, their personal laptop or something, and then they start it and they, they wonder why everything's locked up. Well, because you can't run it in the background. The FileMaker Pro client runs in the foreground. So, um, so you need a dedicated machine. So stick it on a shelf and forget about it and it'll just keep doing its robot goodness until its power supply fails. There are a few problems. The first is it does need a dedicated machine to run it. So there's another machine you have to buy and support and everything. Um, meticulous error trapping is necessary uh, because we'll all experience it when, when we do our first robot is you, you program it like you're programming it for a user. And then when you turn it on, all hell breaks loose because you're not thinking like like it's just a machine and can't answer things and think you have to do the thinking for it all the way through and you also have to error trap in such a way that you can look back on it and say what happened when it goes off the rails and you can figure it out um so yeah like the the quintessential example is people put a show dial dialogue in you know to show an error well that robot will sit on that dialogue until the cows come home because there's nobody to push the button saying okay so you don't use those um and then once once turned on it will execute exactly what you tell it to do um <laughs> that's that was sort of a joke uh you know a friend of mine once told me when i was you know getting into development and i wrote a process that necessitated restoring from a backup let's just say that and uh he said you know a computer's only going to do what you tell it to do and so my example there is the one I burned up on. And if you lose context in FileMaker, you know, like you forget to close a window or you close it and you shouldn't, you can delete all the wrong records and uh, uh, things like that. So you really need to think through your, pro your programming when you, when you work with a robot. And then your robot runs with full access and that can be an issue too. So it needs to be a secured machine in a secure environment and everything and don't let meddling hands get into it because you can stop the robot as you'll see and uh, if you if it's full access logged in, you can just jump in and start writing scripts. So <laughs> it, it, it could be a it could be a, a security issue. So so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to use a case study to look at how we do this. Um, and one of my clients, a guy named Brian at Bridgetown Finer Meats, was gracious gracious enough to allow me to show his stuff. Um, so let me kind of give you the background. Um, Bridgetown is a business in Cincinnati, Ohio. They're a full service butcher shop, deli catering. I think he sells wine and something else too. But um, when he came to us, he got in touch with me and he said, Hey, I want, you know, I want my folks to be able to pre-order stuff and pick it up, which seems pretty easy on the face of things. Um, turned out it was, it was a lot more in depth than we expected. Um, he didn't have, you know, some hundred thousand customer user base. So um, he, he, uh, I said, well, you know, we really got to watch how many people we're going to we're going to get on this thing because you got to pay for these connections. And uh, we wound up going with WebDirect for this solution, um, doing a, the comparable website in Django or PHP or any web technology would have tripled the cost at least. So this was a good it was a perfect fit and probably the the most complex fit I would recommend for a WebDirect solution. Um, so he had a short time to live. Uh, he wanted to get it up and going. So WebDirect uh, enables really quick development. And he, he anticipated the need to make some rapid changes and updates. So again, WebDirect is better for that than, than a, you know, a Django site or PHP. Um, he had an existing solution in operation. So we had to merge into that and pull data from it and be able to use it. And so now we're going to go look at his, his site. I'm just going to jump out of the presentation here. Maybe. There we go. So this is his main website, um, BridgetownFinderMeets.com. And he built this on Wix or something. I, I'm not sure. Uh, it was just a basic, um, you know, website package, like a five-pager or something. 
and it's got the typical typical things that you can select from and it, it looks nice it's it's a, a well thought out attractive design um you know i told him when we started this you know my my aesthetic design capabilities end at stick figures and hangman so he was responsible for the for the look and uh so we just maintained this look into the web direct and so what we did is we created this online order here and i'm just going to show you the site well the, there's the page that launches it and once we get to the site it pops in a new tab you'll see it flash maybe filemaker web direct and then it it loads the URL masking, BFM online order. And we use a separate uh, URL for it. You can see up there, BFM online order store. We maintain the secure connection by having an SSL on FileMaker server. You gotta do that, otherwise this thing throws an error. Any, any of the modern browsers will. And this is the homepage and that's his store. And that's him, wouldn't you know? Right there on the left. I think that's him anyway. Um, so it looks just like a regular website, right? It's got a little login page and create an account, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to cheat. I'm just going to use um, my one of my test accounts. It logs in and it launches to this, and it's got a standard, you know, array of of products and such. Some pop up windows. So, so to clarify, um, can, I'm going to interrupt to clarify. So this is for their employees to be pushing on, not the customers, or is the no? This is this is public facing for customers. Okay. And it takes live orders for product. Wow. Okay. So, you know, let's say you want cheese. You can go over and search categories over here. You can search up in the um, search box. Oops. Oops. If you type cheese properly. And it's a live, live link to his database. So if we want pepper jack or whatever, we just say add to cart. It puts it in the cart. Special instructions. This is all native FileMaker. This is nothing... Um, nothing special no special web technologies this is straight web direct and i'm a long ways from his server so there's a little delay in executing some of these scripts but you can see it's got live updates of the totals etc cart view you name it full account management you can come in and see your past orders reorder it edit your info the whole nine yards all web direct we can go in and review our order and say, oh, yeah, I do want to get this $23.96 worth of macaroni and cheese. I'm sure it's good. Goes into a checkout, and he has variable pickups, so it's smart enough. Like if you try to do it on a Wednesday, hey, sorry, we're closed. Um, all this stuff is just boilerplate FileMaker scripting. It's nothing, nothing crazy. You can see it's got a, a test credit card in there for those of you that watched my, my previous um, – uh, presentation the 1111 is the is the visa test card um, but you can update it you know I can change that credit card right here and as I mentioned in the previous example the way I do this is through the authorized.net payment profiles so when I create a credit card record in here I'm not storing the credit card record just the profile with one exception when I go to uh, create the payment profile I have to store the credit card number for about 10 seconds. And that allows the robot to execute the transaction at authorize.net and return the data to the script, okay? Um, if you don't do that, you can run into that asynchronous problem I told you about where any kind of web delay or user interaction can blow the context for your script and your script will fail. So you may actually create a, pro a payment profile, but you won't get the payment profile code to use. or um, something else happens and the, the data never gets sent to authorize.net. So if I were to click place your order, it would put an order in the system, which would later be charged to the payment profile corresponding to that credit card number. Everybody with me? And since you can't answer, I'm going to assume you are. Um, and then another cool thing. <laughs> there is one question um, when you get to a spot, but yeah. Yeah, right, right here's a good spot. What's up? Okay, so uh, Lynn in Austin, Texas says, was the window to log in a card window? If not, how did you do that? It was not a card window. It's a, a static layout. And what I did, well, I'll show you what I did. Um, it's just a couple of edit fields. One is set to password type, you know, so it masks the characters. And uh, yeah, it's just a regular layout. Okay, and then do are you? Yeah, so I'll I'll talk to you about that. It's one of those sort of security things, but 
um, you want to make sure. Uh, does that do that trick where you have it re-log in then once you do that, or does it? Yeah. So I wasn't I wasn't planning on getting into the security side, but yeah. So here's here's the the grand picture of how it works. When somebody comes to this website, it automatically logs them in as a generic user with a highly restricted yes. privilege. Set. Yeah, they can do nothing except yeah, they can go to the login page and re create an account, and that's about it. Okay. And then uh, once they're verified and validated, it it relogs them in as as a authenticated user. Okay. Yeah. And even that is a really tight privilege set, and. Uh, that's why I do so much with perform script on server because I pipe it off to the server and run it with a different privilege set, different username. Okay. And um, also the, this is a totally separate file from his main system and okay. everything's locked down on it. So, so, the, so the important takeaway, and I need to stress this for everyone, cause this is how I ended up paying uh, Josh Ormond. If you guys know who Josh is paid him 200 bucks one time. Cause I, I uh, stuck my foot in my mouth sideways and then chewed down real aggressively. So the issue is with, with security is that he rolled his own security, but he didn't really. Because the idea with the way the security works is that, and Nick has done this before, and, and Matt Petrowski has talked about this. If you just roll your own security and then you restrict people based upon, like layouts are hidden and fields are hidden and, and things like that, you're asking for trouble because that can be hacked. I got I paid a uh, Josh one time. I, I we set up a solution like this, and I was working with Taylor Sharp at the time. And I said, okay, I'll give anyone two hundred dollars cash if they could hack this. And between Wem Decourt and Josh Ormond, they hacked it in eight minutes. And they weren't malicious. Yep. I just paid them two hundred bucks. And so what happened? So the idea is that if you create your own like login, right, your own FileMaker login, which is running with a script, it has to basically when it's done immediately. It needs to immediately log really re-log in with that person's actual credentials so they are restricted into their privilege set and you're using the filemaker based security to limit what they can do not your own scripted security Does that makes sense very 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 important so um it's kind of a sleight of hand of what's happening here but it's what nick does and i make sure people do this because otherwise if someone just logs in and and bill is restricting you know kind of like in their account uh, in anything that the, the privilege set allows them to do, even if you hide it from scripts or whatever, they can use data viewers, they can use all sorts of JSON tricks and execute SQL tricks, and there's about eight or nine different like holes that you can get into and tear this thing open. And so you don't want to have that problem. So it's very, very, very important, right? So you see the real credential logging in right here. At the end of the day, you really have to use that. So. So that's awesome. So Bill, yeah, sorry about that, but it's a good point because I don't want people thinking they're going to roll their own security. You you rolled your own front end to the security is what you did, correct? Yeah, yeah, and then you rely on actual user accounts and such for for everything else. Perfect. Yeah, that's the point, right? So I don't want to I don't want to be lost on you, everyone, because back in the day it was lost on me, and then about six years ago, five years ago, whatever it was, I inserted all my feet into my mouth at one time it was very exciting because i said well 200 bucks no big deal if i lose it but no one should be able to break this in eight minutes eight minutes so anymore you've learned that you don't you don't write your own scripts to protect it you use filemaker's built-in security which is pretty robust uh cool all right all right cool. okay all right next. so um keep, keep and going. then the last last little trick of this this thing is you know how in web direct maybe maybe these folks don't but if you um, if you log out of a web direct file, it takes you back to a server homepage and it shows you all the files on that server and it's really ugly and it's unprofessional. Um, there's a little trick you can do to get away from that where it uh, kicks you back to the, the place you need to go. So there, there's a lot of little web direct tricks you can do that really give it a kind of a professional flair. Um, and uh, you know we'll have to we'll have to do that another time maybe. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go back over to FileMaker now. Um, I'm actually going to make that big, I think. I'm not used to working with one monitor, so please bear with me. So this is, this is the basic, um, this is the basic layout. And somebody asked, you know, is this a card window? It's not. And so if we look at it, I assume they're asking because it's centered and everything. Um, the, the way, the way that's done is through branch, well, branch navigation to ensure that, for the platform, because this is also mobile responsive, um, it it shows the right layout. So there's like a phone version of this as well. And um, 
and it works. So you can see I'm, I'm putting the username and password into globals, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I want to talk about credit cards. So, um, so let's go to the script workspace and see if we can make a little more room on the screen. Whoops, wrong one. Make a little more room here. And if you guys remember from Friday's presentation, we had a, a payment profile master script where it created the, the customer profile ID and the payment profile ID. That's this script. Okay, so this is one of the ones that we fire. It's very similar to the one in the sample file, only I have three options in here. So you can see um, I do update payment. So like if somebody has an existing one, it just updates their payment ID. Um, there's a uh, create payment only. So that's what we use when we need to create a payment ID. And then it's both where we create the customer and the payment ID. Um, so if you, want, if you want to talk about this in detail, we'll have to do it offline. This is exactly the same script with the changes I mentioned that I included in the sample file. I literally cut and pasted it and then altered it out of here. Then we have a delete profile. You know, people have the right to delete their info. So um, if they go to their web, web client, they can uh, say delete my stuff and it does it. And um, we also check for an existing order before profile deletion. So that way we still get paid if we need to. That's the authorized.net scripts in the mobile file. Pretty wild, huh? You see there's no credit card, anything in there. What we do have though, is in the cart, we have order creation. And this is this kind of gets to how I how I do this. Um, hopefully that's big enough for them to see, Richard. It I'm zooming in, it's pretty screen. small. Yeah, it's pretty small. I'm zooming in a lot over here, so. Okay, so in the top screen from about here down to uh, now here, I'm firing a perform script on server that just takes all the order data and creates an, an order in the main file, in the main solution file. That's it. That's what perform script on server is good at. Go do this stuff, and uh, if it screws up, we know it's still going to be there because we can see it live on the backside. Whereas on a web call, you can't. And that's why perform script on server is not the best solution for credit cards on the web. But for this kind of stuff, perform script on server is really good. So hopefully you understand that difference. Next, um, let's go over to the main file. So here's our section. From here down, this is how we control everything for the web stuff. Um, Authorize.net, we have something called create PMOD. Now, PMOD is a table I have called payment modifications. So let's take a look at that table really quick. You can see it's it's nothing too crazy. We got our Z fields, which every table should have. ID customer, credit card number, expiration month, year, type. This is the create both, delete, update only, that, that part of the script. Whether it's processed or not, an error to tell us what happened, the error note, and some more credit card stuff, okay? Now, I can't show you this actual table because it has real credit card numbers in it, presumably. Uh, for a few seconds, and I don't want that flashing on the internet for all of time. But here's what happens. The robot goes and looks at this during one of its cycles and says, do I have any payment modifications to do? Oh, yes, I have to update this one. And it does it, and then it deletes this record, okay? So every 10 seconds or so, this will get cycled through. I think the, the robot actually cycles every seven seconds, um, but... Uh, it only takes like three seconds for the, all the payment or all the uh, robot processes to be handled. Uh, that's pretty fast, Bill. That's really fast, actually. Yeah. It is. Do you have any problems with the robot crashing, or is it just pretty reliable in that thing? Um, as long as they're um, rebooting it every couple of days, we don't. Because as you know, you know, FileMaker can loop fifty thousand times before it, it craps. Um, so every couple of days, I have them reboot the machine physically. And we haven't had any issue. Okay. Yeah, because we we ended up quitting. We at midnight we, on our robot. I think it quits, and then it, it, it actually quits FileMaker and restarts FileMaker at between midnight and twelve thirty or something, right? So yeah. So so what I've done on other clients, um, the one you're probably thinking of is is I wrote a, an automator script to dump out a FileMaker and go back in. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So all right. Um, 
So these scripts are exactly the same as the ones I showed you the other day. Create payment profile, customer ID. It fires off the request to authorize. So you can see here, register the plugin, uh, auth acquire the authorized.net credentials, set no errors. What you don't see is the test mode, right? Because this is live. And so then I do CC profile, create customer. And this fires you know, via the robot from that master script. Okay. Same with the payment profile. So it, it's nothing magic. It's just using the robot, right? Um, so let's look a little bit further into how this robot works. Um, I can I can remote in and show you the robot in action. Okay. I wasn't planning to do this, but it's kind of cool. It won't uh, spew any credit cards at us, probably. I hope, right? No, huh? Okay. No, they they should see it though. Okay. Oh, so holy I haven't seen this guy in a long time. <laughs> yeah, I stole it without even a moment's thought, right? Okay, yeah. So I was like, yeah, we're doing I, this. I Every designed time... this interface with that. The... <laughs> um, that TeamViewer is not letting me expand that anymore, um, but there's two panes to this robot file. On the left over here, can you highlight that in pink or whatever? It's That's the, uh, that's the error log or the completion log that gets spit out every time it cycles. And then on the right, you have some dependencies and a schedule note, you know, just so anybody looking at it knows exactly what it's doing. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to take a chance and I'm going to stop this for just a minute and show you something. And I got to be quick because this robot also controls his receipt printing in his store. <laughs> and um, OK, so. There, no well, one we, at the we, finer means place. Please print a receipt right now. Stop. We had to. We had to do that because um, to get around FileMaker printing weirdness. Mm -hmm. So he can. This allows him to print all his receipts and everything from an iPad. Ah. So he's using. He's using Go as a mobile POS in his store, and then we wrote a quick print manager for him here to to do that. So I'm just going to stop it. Boom. So I hit the stop button. And I'm going to go right into the script engine, uh, maybe. Tools, script, oh, wrong one, dang it. I don't want debugger, I want script workspace. So this is the robot script, guys. Pretty impressive, huh? One script. And there's also a register 360 works uh, plugin. Yep, we always do that. That's it. Okay, so let's go back, start his robot. Woohoo! None the wiser. Sorry, Brian. If you're watching, you're right. You're, you're writing from. You were writing on that log at the top. That what was the new entries are at the top, right? Yeah, it, it's uh, it kicks them down. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. So you've seen the robot. Um, so now let's let's take a look at the um, the robot script and see what it does. So we call it the robot master. Um, and up here, what we do is we set a bunch of environment variables and some other stuff. The important part is right down in. Where'd it go? Well, from right about here, this loop. Um, so this loop comes popping down and it starts running through the various robot tasks right here. Okay, so right here you can see, dang it, wrong place. It's uh, process PMOD records. So that's creating the payment profiles, the customer IDs, the deletions. This one is fire the print robot. That is what prints for him. This one is delete processed PMOD records. So I found, this is one kind of weird idiosyncrasy, if I ran the deletion script for PMOD right after the process script from PMOD, it wouldn't delete them. And I, I don't know if I had a commit, a commit records issue or what, but just uh, separating it with the fire print robot fixed it. So, yeah. um, and then finally I have process pending charge records. And so what'll happen is when he processes one of his orders and says, okay, instead of a dollar fifties worth of American cheese, you're getting a dollar 75s because the weight, you know, um, he releases that order and the robot sees that it's released, picks it up, grabs the payment profile associated with it and executes the charge. So like I said, this happens really, really fast. Uh, one of the coolest uh, robot implementations I've done and it's simple, simple, right? But this is how you can get around that implementation problem of using plugins on FileMaker Go and FileMaker Server, or excuse me, FileMaker uh, Web Direct. Yep. You can you can do this exact same thing um, from Go. It doesn't have to be from Web Direct. In fact, from Go, it's probably even easier. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but it's 
it ain't rocket science, as they say. We do have one question. It's slightly on and off topic. Lynn says, how do you keep customers from using the back buttons in the web browser instead of using FileMaker buttons? Um, FileMaker pretty much manages that. Okay, but because... in WebDirect, when you go back, it tells you that you have to re-log in and you screw yourself, right? That's yeah, it kills, it kills the session, right? Yeah. So um, that was one of the problems with uh, the WebDirect solution. So let's just see what what happens. So let's. Uh, I'm going to do the shortcut to it. I'm not going through his main website. So we log in. Let's uh, let's go to Cheese. These are just portals, by the way, guys. On the left and in the center and on the right, they're all portals. Okay. So we'll go to Frozen. Go to a product. Chicken with stuffing. So there's the product detail. So now I hit back. What happens? Boom. There's no getting around that. And that's because of the way FileMaker maintains session control. So if somebody knows how to get around that, I'm all ears and would gladly take that information off your hands. We'll gladly pay you for <laughs> for the answer yeah. to that problem. Because that's that's a big one. And you're you're pretty astute for for pointing that out. You know, most people don't really think about how the back button works. But in FileMaker Web Direct, that's a real issue. Um, similarly. If since I didn't come to this from their main website using their link, um, let me just uh, get in here. I use the logout button here. We'll get some different behavior. Boop. Now I get that nasty database um, uh, main page. Yeah. So. It's all in how you link to it and how it remembers where to go at the session end. Yeah. Well, hopefully when they uh, kind of retool uh, this at some point that they fix those uh, gaping holes because those are freaking massive gaping holes. They are. Um, so anyway, I, I, that's all I have for you. I hope that explains it well enough. Um, it's, it's, it's not hard once you've done it once. You're like, oh, man, that's easy. But until you've done it, it's like, you know, pushing the pushing the rock up the hill. Uh, Lynn says, "Yeah, does your sh does your script call the robots first check to make sure the robot is actually running?" No, it does not. Um, what it does is it puts the PMOD record in um, because that's separate from the robot, and the robot is always running in theory. If it's not, the PMOD is going to sit there and get older. Uh, eventually the, the robot is going to run and it's going to process it. So what happens in the meantime? Does the user notice that? No, they do not. So what I do is, um, remember I told you about you can't keep the, um, the credit card number. You have, to, um, you have to mask it or whatnot, and that's exactly what I do. So when I update, I'm trying to remember where that is. In essence, when I when I send the PMOD request to create it, I uh, I return a redacted card number and set it for display so it looks like it happened. Ah, okay. Because because we don't charge the card in real time until after the people fill the order, so it doesn't matter. It just looks like they changed it, and then um, at some point down the road, you know, he's going to notice when his receipts quit printing that his robot's not working. He's going to go reset it, and it's going to process the payment transactions and update the appropriate records. So, so you don't know the credit card's really, 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 really going to work until later on in their business process. It's, it's up to them to figure that process out. Correct, correct. And that was also one of the requirements for me because um, it's not like he's just doing digital downloads of a book or something where it's you know millions of potential customers. He knows all these people. Oh, okay. You know, they, they live in the area in Cincinnati, and he's got kind of an eclectic um, following. So it's it's not like he's going to be the target of a bunch of fraud. And even if he is, he's not going to hand anything over without a paid receipt. So yeah. there's no risk. So Yeah, and then the other side is that do you do a, a basic credit card validation when you submit? Maybe you said this, but you, there's basic formulas to, to verify that you have the right number of digits and it's – theoretically a good card it doesn't check the bank but yeah so um you folks are familiar authorize, with that right so well go ahead go ahead and explain that. yeah authorize authorize.net does that for you um it's got it's called well the 360 function is like cc validate card i think uh -huh. and uh what it does it goes off to authorize and says hey look at this number is it real and authorize will say yes or no 
uh, because there is a top secret formula for figuring out if if a card is real or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not so top secret anymore, I don't think. But yeah. Yeah. So, true. CJ Berlin says very interesting aspect with the robot, but didn't get why you didn't use a REST API of a system provider, um, and you lose all the Google power hiding your products behind a web direct server. Well. I have a simple answer for that. It's all about the money, money, money. Yeah. Who wants to pay? Who wants to pay for that? For this, um, you can do all kinds of cool stuff, but I don't work for free. And uh, you know, the more you do, the more it costs. And budget is a very real limiter in every project. You know, if I ever get a client that says, "You got carte blanche," I got millions and millions. Do your worst. Yeah, I'm gonna have fun. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> in, until worst. that time, yeah. until that time, yeah, I'm gonna have to kind of find the best solution given the budgetary constraints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So WebDirect is a budgetary uh, fix for rolling your own website, uh, point blank. Uh, and then the uh, other part was the API, the REST API. Uh, you you don't have good visualization uh, of the API firing out of the server against. Anytime the PSOS or SASE or any server-side process does a, a, a insert from URL, there's not good visibility into what the server is actually doing and what it's actually seeing, right? Makes sense? Right. That's what Bill was talking about earlier. So there's really two questions here. One is the money one. The other one is a lack of uh, bug testing and visibility. You can have the server do it. If it's reliable and never has a problem, that's fine. But if there's a problem, you can't really see what it's doing. And so by running it through a copy of Pro on a robot or some sort of similar process, you actually have some visual, you know, if it blows up and kills everyone, you'll have, you'll, you'll be able to examine the bodies for evidence of what transpired. If yeah. it blows up on the server, there's, there's no one left. There's not even a dead body around to inspect to see what happened. You just know it failed. So now what, what, what you can do um, to kind of take, take that question and run with the ball and what we've done with other solutions is we use something called, um, an allo api and so tim dietrich a lot of people know tim he's former filemaker guy and went out on his own um, tim dietrich came up with a an api package that allows you to hit filemaker from a non-filemaker api and, and do all kinds of cool stuff and we've employed that but that is deep water that is not something you know john and mary average developer can go do it requires learning another completely different computer language, and um, and it's it's reserved for large systems, large systems. Um, so it's a lot of time and money and expertise that most folks just don't have. Sorry, Bill, I was so, muted. What was it called? I muted myself. That was my fault. Oh, it's called Allo. No, I was looking. Yeah, A L O E. I was looking for my mute button after th the fiasco on Monday. I was Tim like, oh no, no. Dietrich. Um, yeah, so Dietrich. Tim. D I E T R I C. There, I yeah, there it goes. Allo for PHP with Tim Dietrich. Here we go. Yeah, so for PHP is the one. Um, there's another one as well, which uh, um, if if we really wanted to go that route, we should have Eisen talk about it. Um, but it allows you to do API integration with FileMaker very, very easily. Um, but like I said, it's it's easy, but it's hard at the same time because it's it's real programming it's not file maker script steps it's it's yeah time if, to actually if, write the code. If, you, if you're like a kyle williams or you know a real code monkey kind of person then you know it's it goes from this low code environment to although it's hard you know when, when bill bill writes hundreds of lines of of scripts it's really hard to call that low code but um i guess there's no code then there's kind of this low code thing and then there's uh you know you're 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 a code monkey writing some bad you know scripting and sql and stuff like that and that's like the kyle kyle williams is that kind of guy that kyle was here and then he's left already so i'm not sure what happened with that but uh well and, you know going down that road opens up possibilities though because you can integrate with filemaker as well as like we do one with filemaker and postgres and so it'll do either and um it's it's pretty wild stuff it's it's cool but like i said not not for the faint of heart all right so uh Michelle Gravel from Montreal said, is Bridgetown website all in FileMaker? 
No, it's uh, Wix or WordPress or something, and then just when you get to the ordering part, it dives off into uh, WebDirect. So correct. Their their in-house system is 100% FileMaker, though. The in-house database system is yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. cool. All right. Well, uh, along the line of today, if you folks have questions about credit card processing, I highly recommend that you reach out to support at RC Consulting. We'll connect you with Bill, and Bill can uh, answer questions you have, etc. For those of you interested in having Bill back to talk about other things, feel free to have, if you have topics, let me know about that. So, uh, Bill, anything else on your end? Bill's done a great job. Bill's first time. Anyone, do we have a, do we like Bill? Do we want him to come back for some more? If so, can I recommend ask that you buzz and let us know? I'm better at just telling dirty jokes. Or you just want Bill to tell you dirty jokes. That's also available as well. So, Foxy Jack says buzz. Scott says buzz. Yeah, they think you did a good job, Bill. That's awesome. Great. Great. Well, I appreciate the attention. You know, not that I actually heard you, but um, it's nice to know that people are listening, and I appreciate it. Good. You guys have done a great job. No, we, uh, we you, you heard everything we said. I just mute myself and magically deal with things periodically. So, all right, cool. Well, it's exciting. It's exciting. And if you have other topic ideas, uh, send those to support at RC Consulting in general as well. We greatly appreciate it. And we'll catch everyone tomorrow. See you. Okay. Thanks, guys. to give you a chance, and that's all you can ask for. Try to rally, down 10, right? Four, short motion by Amendola from the left. Brady takes the shot, goes step, stands in, throws it left for Amendola, reaches up and snags a high throw and lands inside the 10, rolling to the nine. Oh, slightly behind him, a 